if we Um, if we wanted to have, um, uh, you guys all feel confident that you could put in a, a two parameter constructor and a default constructor for both mammals and animals and get them to call each other? So in other words, do you feel confident you could have a constructor where you specify the noise and the name? Do you feel confident you could set up a constructor where you didn't specify either and they got given default values? I think that would be a really good warm up for you guys to write those two other constructors for animal so you'd have three constructors for animal just sitting there and then practice calling them. And then when that's working, put the three in as well for mammal and just watch, just see how it goes. Just so you get the sense for how one constructor calls another. Does everyone think that they could give that a shot? I think that would be a good exercise to do as soon as you got home. I'll put this code up tonight. I actually have lectures till nine, so I'll put it up after nine. I have no network access because I'm on stupid UniWide. Um, <laughs> does, any, does anyone ever manage to connect to UniWide? How do you do it? What's your secret skills? Windows, yeah. <laughs> no? Have you got, you've got connected? Oh, I've tried that, but how do I get it? It never pops up a password. Do you have to go to a web page? Go to any web page. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get in with WebAuth. Does anyone get in without using WebAuth? You know, the, the crazy thing is, uh, one of my students working on a project for me is a, one of the IT guys at this uni, and his job is looking after networks. He's a network engineer. And every time we sit down with a meeting, it's always me saying, I've lost UniWide again. And he says, oh, it's easy to fix. It's just, just some magic and I've got it. And I say, oh, good. How long will this last for? And he says, forever. And I see him the next day. I've lost UniWide. I don't know what it is. I must be doing something wrong. Okay. Um, so I think everyone should have a go at doing that and let's now jump onto cues because I talked a little bit about yesterday about the difference between subtyping and subclassing and I gave a fairly convoluted example. I wanted to show you that example in code but I've made it a bit simpler. All right, suppose we've got a queue class um, and here's a main function in a class called test queue which is going to test my queue class. Now I wrote the queue class before I came in today and then I Java docked it so we can see what it looks like. But the idea is I'm not going to show you the implementation. So we're now going to be in the position of someone that has a class already written that does everything we want and then we want to add some extra functionality to it and we're going to try doing that by extending and we're going to see how we can just use all that code without looking at it, without seeing it, without knowing anything about it. So uh, here we go. Just let's just look at our suite of tests. We first we print out we're running test queue. I always put something like that in because I'm always running the wrong thing without knowing it. Nice to have some confirmation it's the right thing. Q is going to be a Q and it's going to be calling the Q constructor which takes no arguments so it's going to make me a Q and then I'm going to call a function called simple string test on the Q and then at the end I'm going to print out all tests pass you are awesome. I've got a list of strings that, of, that I'll be putting in the Q. This is a, this Q will model a Q of objects so you can put any object in so I'm going to stick a whole lot of strings into it um, and there's six of them and then the patients and the idea is this is a Q at a hospital. It's really important. These are the people that have come into the emergency room and we deal with them in the order they come in. I don't know why we do that. That's not probably what hospitals do. Um, and, but I, I said that because I wanted you to see it would be quite serious if we lost someone from the queue. Someone just sitting in the corner day after day, too polite or too losing blood to say, <laughs> what about me? Okay, it isn't fair, that's right. Uh, so. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to add the patients to the queue. So queue.add, there's an add function to the queue. And if I hover over it, the Java doc will pop up. This is one nice thing about Java doc. It pops up as little comments inside Eclipse for you. So it'll say queue.add takes in an object and adds an object to the rear of the queue. And the parameter is O, the object to be added. Uh, so it's going to add the first patient in, then the second patient, then the third patient, the fourth patient. It's going to add all six patients into the queue. Then it's going to print out the queue. So I've given the queue a two string function that will print out the queue in an attractive looking manner. Then it's going to assert that the queue has a size greater than zero. So that's another interface function for the queue. Size returns the size of the queue. Head returns the head element of the queue. Returns the head of the queue, leaves the queue unaltered. It's undefined if the queue is empty, so don't call it if the queue is empty. Returns the object that's at the head of the queue. So we're going to check, we're going to assert that the, head, the object at the head of the queue is equal to patient zero. Now equal to means what am I comparing here? 
Am I comparing the strings have the same value? No, what am I checking? They're pointing to the same thing. It's the same string. I've got two references to the same object. So I'm checking what I put in is what's coming out. I haven't got some weird copy of it or change thing. I'm getting what I put in coming out. And then I'm expecting, uh, then I'm going to remove that element and then I'm going to expect that the, the first, uh, the, the second element of the array at index one is going to be the next guy in the queue. I'm going to go step through the queue, pulling the people off one at a time. It's not a very complex test, is it? Just pulling them out one at a time, making sure they all pop out in the right order and haven't been fooled around with. And then at the very end, I'm going to check that the queue's empty. So that is my test. Let's run it. It's very, very simple. And what happened? Running test queue. Remember, the first thing it did is not really a testing thing. It just prints out the queue. So Eccles is at the front of the queue, then Blue Bottle, then Min, then Nettie, then Wallace, then Henry. And then it says, all tests pass, you are awesome. So it all worked, the queue worked, woo hoo 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 Okay, so we've got the queue. Let's just kill the, let's just get rid of the mammal. Here we go. All right, now I want to make a different sort of queue. Because I've got a head cold and my cognitive capacity has been reduced. So I want to have a flaky queue because I feel my brain's like that at the moment. And if you told me all the things I had to do, if you, I'll remember the first thing you told me. I'll probably remember two things, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to remember an infinite number of things. How many things could I probably remember? I, I thought three. I could probably remember three, and I'm probably going to forget the fourth one. So let's write a flaky queue that every fourth element it just forgets. So you just add it to the queue. It goes, yeah, sure, I added it, I promised. Okay, but it's not going to add it. And now a flaky queue... If I said, guys, we're going to sit down and write a flaky queue, you'd go, oh, no, we haven't got all that time in the lecture. It's a real pain, and we're going to have to write a two-string function. We're going to have to use array. I used array list, by the way, my implementation of queue. So look at the code, because you can see the code once you leave here, and you'll see how to use array list. Um, oh, it's a real pain. I don't want to do that. I'm too lazy. If only I could inherit a queue that did everything, and then I just have to modify it to make it a flaky queue. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to inherit a queue. We're going to make our own flaky, flaky queue. is too long to write, so I thought I'd call it a flu. <laughs> we're going to have a flu, and um, it, rather than writing it all, we're going to just get most of it given to us for free. So here's my flu. Public class flu extends queue. So now it's got all the queue functions. Woohoo! It's got an internal variable called use, uses. How many times it's been used? And every time someone calls the add function, it increases uses by one. And if it's a multiple of four, if it's divisible by four, uh, it does nothing. Otherwise, it adds it. It adds it whenever it's not divisible by four. So every fourth one gets left out. Does that make sense? So I've written my own add function. So although I got given an add function, I inherited one from Q, because remember, add was one of the Q functions. I wrote my own one, so I've overridden my parents' function. Because I couldn't be bothered to actually write it myself, what I do at the end is I just call my parents function. Super.add means call my parents function. Okay. Does that make sense? So in all other respects, it's exactly like a queue. Everything's a queue. It's got all the queue stuff. But I've just fiddled with the add function by writing my own one to replace the old one. And my one calls the other one at the end. Is, 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 everyone's looking blank. Is that because it's so obvious? Yes. Good, 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 good. Is there someone it's not obvious for after? Um, no? Okay. It's quite hard to say that, isn't it? All right, so there's the flu. Let's check the flu out. Let's how is how are we going to see if the flu works? Well, let's just add them into the flu. I'll just comment out the tests and print out the flu. Uh, whoop. Just commented out all the tests. And how am I going to make it? Um, Q, Q equals new. I'm not going to use a Q constructor. I'm going to use the flu constructor. Now, flu is a Q because it's extending Q. Sounds a bit Dr. Seussy, doesn't it? <laughs> we could have. Next time, I'll do a, a ox one. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So we're going to, and I better call it F just so you don't get confused. Oh, well, it is a Q and a flu at the same time. All right, is everyone cool with that? It's taken in a. New flu, but that's all right because the flu is a Q. F gets passed into string simple test. String simple test is expecting a Q. A flu is an example of a Q, so it's okay. We know it's an example of a Q because it extends Q, so it's okay, so it gets passed in. So I can leave all the rest of the code the same and I'll run it. And we'll look at the test. 
Woohoo! There's the test. Or maybe we should see both of them. Maybe we should say a Q. Let's make a Q and a flu and print them both out. They both get, the same elements get inserted into both of them, but let's see what the two look like. You can see the Q has these guys in it, but the flu has lost Neddy, the fourth guy, which is what we wanted. Does that make sense? So everything's cool. So we've seen the advantage of code reuse, but what's the disadvantage? You can't use a flu in place of a... You can't use a flu in place of a Q. It would be a very, very bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, this could be good. I think we can do Dr. Shoes. <laughs> Um, let me, here are some new things that, let me show them to you. We can just go on and on and on. Okay, so, uh, yes, because a flu extends a, a queue, as far as Java is concerned, a flu is an example of a queue. It is a queue. But is a flu a queue? You don't think so? I don't think so too. Let's have a look at the test. I, copy, I commented out the test before, but if we wanted to know if it was a Q or not, well, let's run our Q test on it. We've already got a perfectly good test that tells us whether something's a Q or not. All right, this function here takes in a Q and it expects a Q to have Q behavior. We're going to pass it a Q. F is a Q. But it fails the test. Ba -bong. And why did it fail the test? Because Henry, because uh, uh, Nettie's gone. Does that make sense? So that is the bad thing about it using extending to reuse code. The bad thing is it now creates lies about what types things are. And those lies are inconvenient lies. Because they will cause us to generate runtime problems. And people will generate things they think are queues. And people will write functions that expect queues. And everything will work magically if everyone complies to the interface, but the guys over here are just making anything they want and calling them a queue. It's just like the, you know, all the people making fake memory sticks at the moment. They just make a fake memory stick and they put on the logo of SanDisk or someone and then they send it over here and you need it for your pacemaker. Ah. Ah. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. So that's violating the contract. So it's a bad thing to do. It's not a good thing to do. So we want to make a flu Our aim is to make a flu without doing extra work, because there's way too much extra work to do, but we don't want to say that a flu is a queue, because, as you know, um, that's not true. So we will make a new class called flu number two. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I'm out of rhymes now. You'll have to help me. Can you give me some rhyming questions? Um, Okay, so here's our flu number two. Now what we're going to do with flu two is instead of using inheritance, I'm not going to say flu two extends a queue because that is just a not honest. I'm saying flu two is a flu two and that's all. But I don't want to have to write queue again, so what am I going to do? I'm not going to use inheritance. I'm going to use hazard. hazard. I'm going to use delegation. I'm going to say a flu isn't a queue, but a flu has a queue. And it can have a queue inside it. And then that can do all the work, but no one's ever going to be able to use a flu instead of a queue. So here's what we do. It's a little bit more work for us, but nothing really. And Eclipse does all this for you automatically, by the way, if you ever wanted to do this. As long as we had a queue interface somewhere, which we'd be programming to, Eclipse would just populate this with the default things automatically. So I'm going to say oh, I have to keep my old users. That's from the old thing. But the new thing is I'm going to store a queue internally. Now when we create a flu2, I'm going to initialize that queue to be a new queue. So I'm creating a real queue and giving, storing that inside the flu2. Before this, what was happening before was there was a call to, what was happening before? Super. Before there was a call to super and that was creating the new thing. But now I have to create it myself. Oh, wasn't much work, it only took a second. Then um, I override add in the same way. But I'm not overriding it, sorry, I'm actually providing a new function called add. And the only interesting thing is before, when I'd have said this.add, because I was using, oh no, I'd have said super.add, 
using my parents' add function. No, I'm using the person I've got locked in the boxes add function, the queue that I'm carrying around with me. Now here's the pain. I now have to write all the other functions. Before I didn't have to bother writing them, but now I've actually got to put the method up there because there's no way of this thing knowing these functions exist. So I have to actually create the other functions. So I have to create the size function that the queue has, but that's easy. It's just a straight pass through to queue's own size. So when anyone asks me the size of my flu, I ask my queue in the box, um, what's your size? Um, I'm trying to do Firefox, I can't, I can't get it, we'll get it. Okay, and then if I want to find the head, I ask the thing in the box where its head is, and um, if I want to do a remove, I just ask the thing in the box to remove an element. Everything else is the same. Now I'm going to run it. No, I'm not, I'm running the old stuff. Because I have to change it, oh, uh, that's my old assertion error, because it was all wrong, 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 wrong. Let me go back to my test queue, where are we? I'm going to go comment it out. Now, I'm not going to say it's a queue because it's not a queue anymore. That's a, an outright lie now. I mean, I can't make that lie. It was always a lie. But before I could make it, and no one would be able to tell. But now I actually have to admit it really is a flu. So I better pass it into flu, flu queue. Oh, it's a flu too. Thank you. That's so cool. Let's run it and see what we get. Hey, it ran the test queue, and then it printed out some gobbledygook, and then it threw an exception. Oh, what was the exception? Oh, I know what the exception was. Well, yeah. Do you know what the exception was? Why is it chucking an exception? Why, why did it grumble when I ran test queue on it? Because it's a flu. It's not supposed to pass the queue test. If it passed the Q test, it wouldn't be a flu. How's a flu different to a Q? It, it has to forget things. If it passes those tests, it's remembered everything. It's not a flu. So to make it a flu, I have to, who did we forget? Patient number four, I think. Go away. Uh, is it patient number three or patient number? Oh, now I'm confused. I think it's the fourth patient, which would be patient number three. So we just won't bother testing that person. There we are, woohoo. Okay, all tests pass, you're awesome. The only strange thing is this, why is it printing out some gobbledygook? Flu2 at 446B7920. It's to string. It's called to string, because remember in the middle of our test code, we said print it out. Oh, go away, micro pause. <laughs> You'd think a micro pause would be shorter than that. Okay, this is how I got my RSI. <laughs> um, so where did it, just before it did all the tests, it prints out, here, here we are, it prints out the Q, or in our case, the flu. Now, I didn't like calling it a Q because it's a flu, I should call it F, shouldn't I? Oh, is that a lot of renaming and retyping? Well, it is if you're not using Eclipse, but if you're using Eclipse, you just go, uh, whoop, I just click on the refactor button, rename it, and I'd like to call it F, please. Thank you. And now it changes it every form. It's very convenient. So yes, it prints it out and it calls, well, I haven't given it a two string function. So how come it can run it? Why isn't it chucking an error? Ah, although I don't say it extends anything, every object extends object. An object has a two string, so it's picked up objects lame two string function. So we really, if we wanted to get a right to string, we'd have to either write our own, or what else could I do? Just pass it through, couldn't I? I could go public to string, um, oh, public <laughs> string to string, uh, return this dot q dot to string. Thank you very much. Go. And now, woohoo, prints it out, and um, Nettie's gone. Okay, woohoo. Does that all make sense? Yes, okay. Now we're going to take uh, a change of pace. We're going to jump back to design because I really want to talk about design. Design, 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 design. Design.
Design diaries. First of all, I've been looking at people's design diaries. Well done. I don't think I've read a single design diary so far that I haven't thought was fantastic. I read one last night where the person each week has thought of another interesting design in the real world. They've found flaws in the real world as they've been um, driving around and looking at things. So that was just fantastic. Just, it's clear that this person is thinking about design and each week they're just finding some little example of an interesting thing about design. You don't have to do a whole lot, but I just want to see you thinking about design each week. So well done, everyone. The um, design, um, design journals are looking really good. Do make sure that um, I haven't seen enough of them. I have a feeling that some people might not have even created one yet. So please do create and add to it each week. Um, all right, I'm on the wrong screen. Next thing is design principles. Well, there's different ways of designing things in different disciplines. And I just thought I'd ask you some little teaser questions. In a film, if you were a film designer, if you were creating and designing and making a film, I guess we'd call that sort of person a director maybe. They probably had the most design input. The film's a fairly collaborative thing, isn't it? But what would you do? What are the sort of design principles for a film? It's because it's certainly not the case, is it, that people just sit down and do randomly any old thing and that's a film, uh, unless they're Disney. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, that's not true for Disney either. Everyone's got a standard way of doing it and there are well-known patterns and things that people follow that tend to make good films. And sure, sometimes you break those rules, but you break them knowing what the rules are and you break them for special design reasons. So, in fact, films tend to be quite homogeneous, I find. There's lots of design principles over and over again in films. I thought we'd maybe try and keep a web page where we slowly added thoughts about design and other disciplines. So I've created one for four different um, disciplines here. For films, we already talked about one already, which is... Uh, <laughs> Avatar. It's not so much a film as uh, spend as much money on spend, <laughs> spend, money, the spend money on special effects rather than the script. The um, the uh, uh, the grease thing of start on a high and finish on a high, and you can have filler in the middle. Not that grease has filler in the middle, but yeah. make sure the beginning and the end is really you know put a lot of effort into the beginning and the end because people tend to be flues rather than cues. <laughs> Uh, and we talked about Buckaroo Bonsai in the end of that. Uh, another thing for films, I was just thinking of design tips for films. I bought a book by Alfred Hitchcock where people interview him um, at various times of his life about how he designed his films. And I'm slowly reading it and I'm hoping I'll get some good insights to tell you about him. But uh, one interesting thing I noticed years ago, I noticed it before I even knew it was a rule, is there's this sort of design principle that most film fo makers follow, which is called the line and crossing, no, don't cross the line. Do people know that one? So there's, you sort of have this imaginary line. You know this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us. Do I have to? No, no. Okay. But you do not? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, just, <laughs> just shout mocking things at me if I get it wrong. <laughs> that could be a feedback. So no, you don't have to tell anyone. So there's like an imaginary line, and the film crew's on one side of the line, and the actors are on the other side of the line. And whenever you see a film, it's always shot from that side of the line. Every scene shot from that side of the line. So when you're cutting between lots of cuts, there's this sort of implied relationship between the cameras and the people being filmed. And I think it wasn't originally a design rule, it was just people used to do it. So we've all unconsciously come to expect it now. So whenever someone does a cut from the other side of the line, it's freaky, freaks you out. Though sometimes you do it for effect, like in the Matrix, they did all that round thing. And the first time, I think I saw an Akira Kurosawa film I was watching, and there was this fight between these two ninja people, and suddenly it was all wrong, what, what, what? And I kept watching it again, trying to work out. I couldn't work out at the time what was wrong, but something looked really weird. And years later, when I found out about the line, I realized that's what had happened. They'd moved the camera to the other side of the road and shot from that side. So closing in on a close-up of your face looking that way, then close-up of your face looking that way, and then a long shot of your face looking that way and your face, and then a sort of side shot with your, you know, it's all making sense because they're all in the context. And then suddenly, I'm up there shooting and you're looking the wrong way. And he, isn't he behind you now? And it's just, okay, that's crossing the line. So that's a general tip, but you can break the tip but it's sort of good to know about it when you're making films because it freaks people out when you break it. So make sure you've got a good reason. Designing novels. So I thought we'd just each week try and think of more tips. Designing novels. How would you design a really good novel if you wanted to make a novel? Because novels are like code. It doesn't matter what's in your head. All that matters is what comes out. And I think every novelist has five novels in their head. And everyone that sits down to write a novel, everyone's got a half-finished novel somewhere. I'm sure by, by the time you die, you'll have a half-finished novel somewhere. And really, it doesn't count until you've actually finished it and got someone to publish it. So there's all this sort of practicality about actually managing your time and finishing. But then there's all this stuff about a narrative arc. The novel's got to have a narrative arc, and it's got to have this, and it's got to have that. It's quite hard to make a good novel. I think people put a lot of effort into the first line or the first paragraph. 
And certainly I know people put a lot of effort into the first chapter because normally when you go to someone to get an advance, if you're a new author, you'd show them the first chapter to get the advance. So you've got to have a fantastic first chapter to get that advance. So yeah. I was just thinking that in a lot of the novels which I like, yes. um, they have a way of taking what's the real world and then moving you into like the kind of the novels kind of realm. So if you think about, say, um, the Narnia series of books yes. by C.S. Lewis, they always yes. have a portal from where the real world is ah. to take you into... So they have an explicit novels. transition to move you from reality into some new place yeah. and they let you know that it's special and different. Whereas magic realism, which is this, you know, Gabriel Garcia thingy thingy, and Salman Rushdie, the idea is you're reading the novel and you think you're in the normal world and suddenly it's, it's not right. Yeah. You know, Hitler's got killed by someone. <laughs> that didn't happen. You know, yeah, 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 that's right. Okay, so there's all, that's a very good idea for helping the reader, you know, sort of signposting to the reader. So there's all these good ideas. I don't know how to write a novel. I wish I did. But I'm sure there's lots of good thought that goes into writing a novel and plenty of good design te techniques. I'm just flagging them all now because I want you to be thinking about them. What if you're a barrister and you're conducting a trial? Imagine before the trial, the barristers sit down and think, how will I do this? And what order will I bring the points in? And will I put this witness on the stand or that witness on the stand? And what will my summation be? And I'm sure they spend a long time before doing the trial planning it so the trial pans out. And us, when we're writing a program, what are the sorts of things? Now the sky's the limit. We can do anything we've got. We've got a half a billion dollar budget with Java. You can do anything. How are you going to decide, well, I'm going to have these classes and this relationship and you've got all these choices. What are the sort of tips and techniques and principles you could follow that would probably lead towards a good design? And of course you could break them if you wanted, if you had a good reason, but it's sort of good to know the tips and techniques that people have worked out because maybe that's going to help guide you in the right direction. So I've started filling that one in. Oh, and here's a good um, principle from Rupert, by the way. This arose in, as a result of a conversation with Rupert. He was saying that he was marking the style of his tute on Wednesday and he was feeling so sick and so stupid from his cold that if anyone's code was the least bit unclear, he found it completely unclear. And he found he was marking them much more strictly than normal. And I thought, oh, that's a perfect test. You should write your code so you can understand it when you're sick. <laughs> because I think actually he wasn't marking more strictly than normal. I think he was marking at the right level then. And probably because his brain is so large, he's normally marking too leniently. You do something confusing, but not confusing to super brain. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you can get, get away with being unclear. But uh, yeah, so I suggest everyone gets sick, if you could, for the next week of the course. Um, to that end, Rupert and I have both come in today. All right, let's look at some design principles. Here we are. Here's just a few, and I'm going to keep adding to the list, and as the course goes on, we'll just build, work our way through them. Uh, keep it simple, stupid. We already talked about that one. Um, well known as, you ain't going to need it. Uh, and in fact, if you click on this, you'll go to the fantastic C2 website. I wanted to give you the link to that, so you can go there. So if you go there, let's just follow that link to C2. You ain't going to need it. This is an incredible website that you can just follow around, or YAGNI, as it's often called, where um, practitioners from a particular school write down all their thoughts, and then other people write comments, and there's a lot of discussion, and, and some people say that's good and that's bad, and you can just read here forever, and you learn lots of cool things. You ain't going to need it. It goes something like this. You're writing some code now to solve some problem you've got now, but you think, I could generalize this, and then in the future, if we ever have ice cream cones as well, this will let me deal with that. So I'm just going to spend an extra 10 minutes now modifying the code to give this functionality that I might need in the future. To which we should say, you ain't going to need it. Don't put it in. Don't put anything in, because you're not going to need it. The things you think you're going to need, you're not going to need them. You'll never finish your code anyway, and the spec will change, and the client will change their mind, and how you imagine the world will be in five minutes' time won't be how it is. So right now, just code what you need now. Don't put anything in that you think you don't need, that you don't know that you need, I should say. Uh, and a good thing that uh, Kent Beck talks about, who's this awesome guy, uh, uh, belonging to a particular community. So I, oh, I brought the wrong book. Damn it. Oh, no, I didn't. I brought it here. Test Driven Development, TDD. He's written a book where I love this way of um, explaining things. Rather than talking about it theoretically, he actually goes through a case study or a series of case studies where he does test-driven development. 
and you see how these tiny little micro steps he makes each time eventually lead to a really neat design. Now I'm not sure if it's universally true, I haven't quite convinced myself yet that you can make a series of small incremental steps that will inexorably lead you to a really good final design, but certainly these examples are very compelling and the first one in fact is so beautiful that I've read it, I keep reading it and scribbling lines all over it, it's so cool. So you should definitely get or borrow from me this book because it's very, 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 very good and at least read the first example about dealing with multiple currencies, it's very nice. Okay. Uh, so um, he has this good idea called triangulation where he says, he's thinking like uh, if you want to um, locate someone, suppose um, the FBI are tracking you by your mobile phone signal, if they know the signal strength, they don't know where you are, they can only sort of locate you in a circle. But if they have two people getting the signal strength from you, then I guess they can locate you to probably two points. And if you had three people tracking you, then, then those three intersecting circles are going to hopefully uniquely define a line and we're going to know a point and we'll know exactly where you are. So he sort of says this thing about generality. His idea is when you're writing something, you've got your test, you've written some tests, don't write more general code than you need. If you're just testing it and you can hard code the answer in, just hard code it in. If you've got one example of something, in other words, don't write something general to solve it. Write something specific to solve that one example. Wait till you've got two different examples that need it before you even think of generalizing it. And ideally three. Does that make sense? So don't start premature generalization, even though we love generalization and OO supports it really nicely. Wait till you have a need for it. And if you just have to have one of something, there's no point in generalizing it. Yeah? Because you ain't going to need it. Wait till you've got two. Um, design principles, low coupling and high cohesion. Cohesion, I've sort of talked about them before. You want your designs, in theory, I mean, you might be able to break this and still come up with a good design, but here's the sort of general metric that people um, tend to agree on and that I really like. Uh, low coupling means a low degree, your modules, your units, your pieces of code should not depend on each other. That the coupling between them should be as minimal as possible. So changes in here shouldn't necessitate changes over here, merely just to fit in with your changes. Everything should be loosely linked so we can change a whole lot of stuff here and no one else is really affected. And we all know, you know, that was ADTs. We talked about that all last year, didn't we? High cohesion, which often goes with it but doesn't necessarily, is that in this class here, I want it to be close, I want it to be cohesive, which means I want everyone to be doing the same thing. I want this class to be doing just one job. If it's got nine methods in it, I want them all to be coherent. I want them all to be angling at the same thing, about the same thing. I don't want this class to be sort of doing two different things. I want everything in this class to be closely related to everything else in this class. I want it to be really cohesive. So this was sort of what we are talking about before. If you've got a loosely cohesive class, it's a suggestion that you should split it into multiple classes and make each of them cohesive. The composed method. Divide your program into methods that perform one identifiable task. Keep all the operations in a method at the same level of abstraction. So, um, uh, presumably that makes sense. Do everything at the same level of detail. Don't be talking about some high level concept and also be fooling around with some low level pointer or counter or something like that. This will naturally result in programs with many small methods, each a few lines long. Okay, the 1010 I've talked about before. Basically, try not to have more than 10 methods and try not to have more than 10 lines for each method. Cyclomatic complexity is, we talked about it last year, I don't know if you remember because we only did it briefly, it's the number of execution paths possible through a program. So if a program just has do this, do this, do this, it's got a cyclomatic complexity of one. It's got one path through it. If it says do this and then either do that or that and then join together and do this, so you've got one if statement, it's got cyclomatic complexity of two because there's two paths through it. And then once you start putting loops and multiple ifs and nested ifs and things like that, the complexity, the cyclomatic complexity increases. And you want to have every method having a low cyclomatic complexity number, like three is a really good number, or two. So you don't want 50 line methods. Where did, he's gone, what was you? Yeah, we don't want 50 line methods, even 50 is too much, unless they're do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Do this. Um, and once and only once. This is the idea of removing duplication, and we're going to come back to this all the time. I know Rupert started talking about it a lot to his students. We don't want you to be cutting and pasting code. Everything should just happen once. There shouldn't be any conceptual thing happening more than once anywhere in your code. So if you've got repetition anywhere, you refactor it. You pull the repetition out of both spots into a common spot, and both those spots common, uh, call, refer to, use that common thing there depending whether it's method or data or whatever. But the idea is we don't want repetition. Yes, then yes. I thought 
a better name for that was dry, don't repeat yourself. Oh, well, yeah, dry, don't repeat yourself is a generalization of once and only once. Really? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that really the same thing though? No, no. Well, go to the C2 website. Look up once and only once, or once and once only, and they have a section on dry and on wet. Yeah, just browse around forever and there's people debating about definitions of terms and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't repeat yourself is a brilliant idea. Yes. Don't repeat yourself. Brilliant. Yes. Um, what about when you've got a solution that is really clean and separated and implementing that dry thing will make it quite ugly and hard, hard to understand? If that's the case, then don't. But I guess what everyone's saying here, and what I believe too, is that's unlikely to happen. But if it does happen, sure, show us an example. It, ultimately, you're not trying to follow these principles. Ultimately, you're trying to write a clean program. That's our number one criteria. These tend to lead to that. But if you can find an example where it doesn't, yeah, show us. Well, an example is this week's lab where you've got the rook and the bishop yes. um, have their own moves and the queen is a combination of both. Yes. So we found there's some code produced between yes. them all, but to pull that out would mean, yes. You pulled it out and it was too messy? Yeah. You can pull it out. You can pull it out cleanly. Just, um, but let's not talk about it because it's not handed in yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, that's you're seeing that reuse. The people that believe in once and only once would see that repetition and they'd be thinking, that's not good, I've got to pull that out. Leaving it in is okay, because there's not much repetition, is it? It's just a few little lines, but, but think about it. You can. Um, yes, they were good interjections there. And Clifford, yep? Uh, with the 1010 button, uh, yes. is that public methods, private or both? Oh, I see. Is 1010 public, private or both? Well, another thing I've put in here is make all methods public <laughs> is another design principle. Um, uh, certainly it's definitely true for public. If you're presenting an API to the outside world that has more than 10 functions in it, you've got to start thinking, uh, that's a bit weird. Uh, maybe you want to have collections of objects, classes serving that or something. You want a facade pattern or something like that, looking after that, which we'll talk about. Um, uh, I'm inclined to think it's just public. I can imagine, I, I don't want to discourage anyone from ripping common code out and making private functions out of it. But I'm also inclined to think that once you start embracing it for public, you might well find, because as you start pulling those private things out, you might well want to start making them public. I think you might well find that it applied to public and private in that you really want all your methods, all your classes to be quite small. So one with 100 private methods, that would suck. And you've got to wonder about what's going on. There's a lot of complexity for a tiny little bit of exposed interface. If you've got 100 big methods down there, there's a lot going on in that thing. It might be too heavy a class. It might be having too many responsibilities. You might want to split it. Yeah. Um, now, I did want to talk about Josh Block from this book, but I think we're out of time. Well, I know we're out of time. So, uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And I will see you next Tuesday. And we'll talk about Josh next week. Yes.